Buffalo would not be here if it weren't for the water. Our water defined our history, and it will define our future. The public has every right to be disappointed. It's an asset that's been underutilized for decades. That's the frustrating thing, is it takes so long to do this. But we have to remember, it took 150 years to get to this point. We've seen more activity than ever along the Buffalo River Corridor. When you see that, then maybe we have turned that corner and things are getting better. Nice and slow here, boys. Lock those catches in. That's one of our goals, is to promote access and use of the water. Right now, I'm mesmerized by going down the canal side and seeing the number of kayakers and canoes, the boating that's out on the river. He's got a bass on. It's a river at large mouth, little one. We were once a vibrant waterfront. We should be a vibrant waterfront, and we can be again. We are in an incredible moment in time for our region. People love the Renaissance. Everybody's got a new hope for Buffalo, and it's all about water. If Our Water Could Talk has been made possible by HSBC and by Honeywell. With additional funding provided by the Joy Family Foundation and Lolly Insurance. Right now we're uh, in Erie Basin Marina and our downtown is right to our uh, right side. Captain Tom Marks has spent a lifetime on the waterways of Western New York. The Buffalo waterfront has so much to offer. We're gonna go up the Buffalo River. It's a look into our past. This was the largest port that handled grain in North America, or in the world actually at one time. Those relics are still here. We are reminded of uh, some of the ills in, in the environment when we come up and down this, this river. The Buffalo River symbolizes the role of water to Western New York, the good, the bad, and the future. The Buffalo River drains a 447 square mile watershed that empties into the eastern end of Lake Erie. Buffalo would not be here if it weren't for the water. It's about transshipment. And that transshipment through the Erie Canal days, through the railroad days, really started to create the base for our industrial growth and development as well. The confluence of having the Erie Canal, the rail infrastructure, and cheap power really made Buffalo the center of the, of the United States economy. Just think of how significant Buffalo, New York was to the entire country to settling the Midwest and West. Buffalo, the port of Buffalo, couldn't grow fast enough. The opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 ushered in a century and a half of economic expansion for Western New York. It also changed the region's water resources forever. Our history is in steel and railroads and chemical manufacture, and the Buffalo River is right in the middle of all that. The history is sort of a context which helps us understand how we got here, from Native American time to canals and moving people and goods to heavy industry to this degradation of a river. Before industrialization, the Buffalo River was barely even a river. The Buffalo River curled and snaked and meandered. The Buffalo River is more like a creek. You know, you could jump across it in certain places. It used to be a wetland. It used to be a, an open marsh area. We consider this to be a remnant marsh, meaning original marshland, and the whole area would have been a, a kind of a marsh floodplain for Lake Erie. The 264-acre Tiff Nature Preserve offers a sense of the western New York landscape prior to industrialization. Where we are now is on the cusp of the Cattail Marsh, which is 75 acres of the preserve. 
as we look north towards the Buffalo River, as far as you can see, in if you were to say going back to the 1700s, it would have all looked like what we're looking at right now. Nature wants Buffalo River to be about a four foot stream with about a half a mile floodplain. Society decided that it's going to be a 24 feet deep river with no floodplain. It's been a long term change for human needs. It's really not a river as we would think of it, more as a navigational channel now to serve our needs of commerce and industry. The transformation from wetland buffer to industrial river occurred with amazing speed. You can see almost every year or every five years different canals and spurs and turning basins and things that were implemented. The sole purpose of that dredging was for navigational purposes, moving goods, people for commerce. By 1900, Buffalo was the eighth largest city in America and one of the greatest inland port cities in the world. With industrialization came pollution, waterborne illness, and waste disposal issues. But these were largely ignored at the time. These were perceived as working rivers in support of commerce and industry. People didn't think about pollution like they do today. That was an era where having smokestacks and polluted waterways was almost a measure of success. You know, we were a thriving economy because of our industrial waterfront. Our local rivers and streams were just a, a piece of the manufacturing process. They were so focused on making a living, it just wasn't a priority to think about what we were potentially doing and what we were potentially passing on to the next generation. We are still dealing with the legacy of the Industrial Revolution. The opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1957 diverted Great Lakes shipping from Buffalo, contributing to the decline of the region's industrial base. Around the same time, there was a growing awareness of the polluted legacy that was left behind. There was a report issued in the 60s on the Buffalo River basically indicating the river was devoid of oxygen, basically was declared dead. This was before the Clean Water Act, before the Endangered Species Act, before Earth Day, before the Canada-U.S. Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Where was the voice for the river? Where was the voice for Lake Erie? Where was the voice for future generations? One of the earliest voices was Stanley Spesiak, a Buffalo jeweler who drew national attention to the region's water problems. A jeweler by vocation and a conservationist at heart. He loved Lake Erie, he loved Buffalo River. Before it was popular to speak out for the environment, he was doing it. He started as far back as the 1930s in some of his environmental activism in Western New York. He was one of the lone voices in saying, we've got a problem here, we're killing our rivers, we're poisoning ourselves. Jill Spesiak Jedlicka is two generations removed from her great uncle Stanley. As the Buffalo Niagara River Keeper, she continues his work. Growing up, my parents would tell me and my family would tell me, oh, you're just like your Uncle Stan, uh, never knowing who my Uncle Stan was at that time. When I talked about Dying Lake, people didn't believe it, but in the 1950s and 60s, when the evidence became so evident on the shores, when the shores were covered with dead fish, slime, and, and sludge, and oil. Eventually, Stanley Spesiak's voice was heard beyond Western New York. In 1966, he was named Water Conservationist of the Year by the National Wildlife Federation. He took full advantage of the recognition. And when he went to Washington, D.C. to accept the award, he happened to be seated next to Lady Bird Johnson. And he actually invited Lady Bird to come to Buffalo and, and said, oh, you can bring your husband with you to see the Buffalo River, to see Lake Erie, to see the troubles that we're facing here. And sure enough, a couple months later, Lady Bird Johnson and President Johnson came to Buffalo. Stanley Spesiak put them on a tugboat, dipped a galvanized pail into the Buffalo River, pull it up, put it on the deck, 
took a spoon and what dripped off the spoon but all that oil and grease. Johnson made the famous statement, this can't be true, this can't be true, I can't believe what I see. And Lady Bird said, I can't believe what I'm smelling, please turn that away from me. And uh, he said, Mr. President, this is what your Army Corps of Engineers is dumping in Lake Erie. It's the same place we draw our drinking water. It's the same place we fish. Two weeks later, he went back to Washington, D.C., and he signed an executive order that prohibits dumping polluted dredge spoils into the lake. And that's an order that exists till today. It was a time where industrialization had taken its toll on waterfronts. And the timing of his voice, it caught the attention of folks, and it resonated. They started to connect and say, yeah, we can't keep doing this to our waterways. Around the time of Stanley Spesiak's dramatic gesture, the Buffalo River and Lake Erie hit bottom. By 1987, the Buffalo River was designated one of 43 areas of concern in the Great Lakes. What this means is they're just identified as the most toxic hotspots in the Great Lakes, the largest contributors of contamination to the lakes. That designation is uh, good and bad. Obviously, it stigmatizes the river. But with the designation comes the ability to uh, apply for grant funding. The designation mandates a remedial action plan. Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper was the first non-government organization given responsibility for administering such a plan. Riverkeeper brought together a public-private nonprofit partnership that has leveraged over $75 million into restoration of the Buffalo River. September 2013 marked a milestone in the restoration with the dredging of the city ship canal to remove contaminants. This truly is a national success story and it has become a catalyst for our region's transformation. They have to be combinations of public and private partners coming to the table, working together to solve the problems of the past to create the future that we all know uh, we can have here. This really has turned out to be a very unique partnership for a large challenge, but a very significant opportunity. And this is a partnership not just to achieve the cleanup, but also to achieve those community benefits that are going to flow from that cleanup. The last four years have been a period of incredible progress. The next two years will change Buffalo for the next hundred years with the progress that we will continue to make. The dredging project will remove almost a million cubic yards of contaminated sediments from the river. But industrial pollution is only part of the challenge facing Western New York waterways. The handling of storm runoff and wastewater is a significant problem with no easy solution. The problem before this generation is now our creaking infrastructure in terms of the sewers themselves. The challenge that Buffalo and Western New York has with our wastewater infrastructure is very similar to other cities throughout the Great Lakes. These cities were built in the 1800s, and back then they didn't think about separating your storm water from your wastewater. So everything's combined in older communities. So whenever there is a significant rainfall or heavy snow melt, it inundates the system of pipes. And so the pipes then are triggered to back up and overflow into our local waterways so the sanitary waste does not back up into people's homes and offices. Can you imagine some of this raw and untreated waste gets discharged in the very same places we're drawing our drinking water. Wastewater treatment is a regional issue involving many municipalities and political boundaries and thousands of miles of pipes. Solutions are costly. Regional municipalities are responsible for developing plans to address the problem. In some cases, that means looking at non-traditional approaches. Here I'm spraying the permeable pavement. You can see that it's pooling up a little bit, but it's dissipating right into the pavement. 
Traditionally, gray infrastructure is concrete, culverts, pipes, that type of thing. Green infrastructure is utilizing nature's natural systems to manage your stormwater overflow. On our street, we have a permeable pavement. It is a porous pavement that when it rains, the water just soaks right in. It's actually pretty cool. In 2012, several local demonstration projects tested new green infrastructure techniques. On the next street over, they did a rain garden. The overflow will run off into that and water the garden and save the water from going into the sewer system. The unique opportunities that you get out of green infrastructure improvements is that it also tends to help revitalize communities. Anything that improves the street, the neighborhood, the water, <laughs> all of that I think is a good combination. Even with progress in several areas, reclaiming Western New York's waterways is not a short-term proposition. But there is progress, and importantly, momentum. I think the river is making a great comeback. And we see that with the, the kinds of species that are utilizing the river corridor. We look at the amount of shoreline restoration as a gauge for success. But I guess the real success comes in the fact that people are seeing the river for the first time as a natural resource to be enjoyed. We also see developers buying up a lot of property. We've seen more activity than ever along the Buffalo River Corridor. Riverbend represents the worst of the region's water heritage and the hope for its future. What you need to do is start back in 1950. That Riverbend area was the oil tank farm that fed a 200-acre steel mill. During the heyday, every square inch was industrialized. The aerial photos of the early and mid-1900s show just how industrialized this section of the river was. These soils uh, were not pristine, and they had a lot of artifacts from that era. As you can see, it's been left alone, and it's starting to recover. Nature's trying to claim it back. It's like creating a living shoreline and, and re-injecting natural life into a, an area that was a barren and dead landscape. The city of Buffalo purchased the former Brownfield site in 2008 at a cost of $4.6 million. Riverkeeper has completed an initial $3 million shoreline restoration project designed to improve the health and access to the Buffalo River. The state will spend $225 million to remake the site into a hub for clean energy manufacturing, creating new job opportunities. Riverbend illustrates two important hopes for the water, economic development and public access. Over the last 30 years in planning for our downtown, our waterfront corridor, my work at the University of Buffalo has over and over again taken me to the community that says, give me access to the water. There's never a question about that priority. It's basically physical access to the waterfront, having the opportunity to throw a line in to fish if you want, to be able to see the water instead of walking around a building, to hop in a kayak or canoe if you'd like, to access your boat in a marina. So to the edge, down and in, ready, roll! That's one of our goals, is to promote access and use of the water. We want to be uh, part of the restoration of the community and the waterfront. One, two, shove! As more attention and resources are dedicated to the waterfront, there are more people than ever accessing the water. In some cases, returning to activities not seen in decades. All right, let's get one foot in, horse across. Rowing started in Buffalo in the late 19th century, 1880s, 1890s. At one point on the river here, we had uh, roughly 12, 13 rowing clubs. These were rowing teams sponsored by the grain elevators and the foundries. But over the years, rowing on the Buffalo River diminished as the economy changed on the Buffalo River. Things are really changing down here. We have parents, hundreds of parents coming down here who've never been to the First Ward, didn't even know what the Buffalo River was, 
let alone its history. So we're bringing people back to where Buffalo started. It's coming back to our roots. The allure for people to come down and go into a canoe or a kayak and basically be able to go right up to the shores of huge grain elevators that loom well over the river and dominate the landscape. It's a good mix of both our past and if you're a nature lover, it's a good place to go see. Access is real important. Over the years, we've developed the waterfront and the harbor, and we walled off our view of the lake. They need to keep this shorefront open for people to get to. Not develop it, leave some of it natural, have some trails, have some little pocket parks along it. There was no access. We run an event called the Buffalo River Fest. We could not find an area to go on the river to have the fest. And it wasn't until then that people could actually walk up legally to the river's edge to see what was going on in the river. The Valley Community Association built two waterfront parks, Buffalo River Fest Park on Ohio Street, now home to an annual water festival, and Mutual Riverfront Park, an old industrial site near Elevator Alley. These two parks have completely turned this neighborhood around. They were dying, they were old industrial, mostly brown fields. Now people have pride, but most importantly, it's bringing people back into the neighborhood. Every day you see kayaks in the river and every day you see boaters in the river. I think parks are the lure. I think parks are the first thing to come. After that, people will come with their commercial. As long as people did not have access to the water resource, there was no need or desire for them to have stewardship of it or to even be concerned about the restoration of it. If you can see the resource and understand it and appreciate it, then you're more likely to, to work for its protection and restoration. This is Western New York's waterfront. So we really need to make sure that it's available, it's accessible. We were once a vibrant waterfront. We should be a vibrant waterfront, and we can be again. It's an asset that's been underutilized for decades. The desire for public access is balanced by pressure for the economic development of the waterfront. In recent years, much of the focus of waterfront development is at Canal Side. Its sole purpose is to provide public access and vitality to the entire Western New York. What we hope to create is a walking community, an area in downtown Buffalo where there was always something happening. So the people will stay down there and once you get a critical mass, you'll start to generate some real economic activity. Waterfront development has been marred by decades of broken promises and missed opportunities. But a change in strategy has brought new hope. We think we're on the right track the whole idea of lighter, quicker, cheaper, little smaller projects as opposed to the mega project. And I think what was stalling waterfront development was the, the silver bullet theory. Inhale, exhale. They're not looking for these big silver bullet solutions of having some commercial retailer come in and, and we can buy stuff. You know, sometimes we just want to go down there and experience the waterfront. It's a big waterfront. What's happening now at the Inner Harbor is a strategic investment with a concentrated amount of work going on that's gonna give us a really important focal point. There has not always been agreement about the vision for the waterfront. A lot of interaction has been antagonistic. It's been fighting, it's been lawsuits, it's been telling somebody else their idea is stupid. But you're seeing a shift within the community now, too, where you have concerned citizens. They're educated. They're informed. They're thinking about solutions instead of just pointing at the problems. And I think what we're seeing at the Inner Harbor has evolved to a much more sensitive engagement of the water precisely because of the voice of the people listening to the water. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. If I voice my concern or I voice what a solution could be, then maybe, just maybe, I can have an input into the progress for our region.
I don't think our work will ever be done. It will be continually updating, reevaluating, and adjusting to the needs of the community. Keep going, man. The Buffalo Waterfront has so much to offer. It's just one of the you know, wonders of the world that we have right here is you know, all this fresh water. We are an industrial city, and we're in a transformation. We're in this rust to blue transformation. It takes a long time to restructure an economy from a sort of single source industrial base to a much more diverse base. As we revive and revitalize as a region, we want to make sure that those decisions and those developments and those industries are coming back to help the economy, but not at the cost of polluting our waterways again. A healthy lake, a healthy river, healthy ecosystem means a healthy economy for Western New York. It is a mid-sized American city struggling to regenerate itself. It's a great time to be here. We have this beautiful, amazing resource that for generations was really taken for granted. We've got a long way to go. We have a lot, a lot of work you have to do, but I think we've turned a corner. The improvements, the recovery, the revival is truly dramatic. Right now you've got a war zone of activity, if you will. I would say within three years we'll have something dramatically different than we have now. People love the Renaissance. Everybody's got a new hope for Buffalo, and it's all about water. If Our Water Could Talk has been made possible by HSBC and by Honeywell. With additional funding provided by the Joy Family Foundation and Lolly Insurance.